The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Oh, thanks so much for the, uh, the kind introduction and uh, thanks to everybody for uh, taking the time today to join me for this presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, uh, a popular youth-based association in China uh, known as the Han Clothing Movement, with whom I conducted uh, ethnographic research from 2010 to 2011. So this, uh, this already uh, is uh, quite a few years back, right? Um, but uh, thankfully, this research has uh, had an output. Uh, so um, this is uh, my book uh, that came out uh, this August about this group. And the Han clothing movement, it's emerged um, in urban areas of China since 2002 with uh, really branches of varying size in most major cities, uh, from Guangzhou in the south uh, up to Beijing in the north, uh, all the way out to um, you know, Chengdu and um, Kunming uh, in the west. Um, and this movement, uh, it's dedicated to promoting a recently reinvented, or perhaps arguably recently invented, yet supposedly ancient ethnic uniform for uh, China's Han majority, uh, officially listed as 92% of the country's population. Now, the, uh, the movement beyond clothing is also engaged in recreating uh, various cultural practices as part of a uh, perceived sort of cultural renaissance that goes along with the clothing, from interpersonal etiquette uh, to rituals to traditional education uh, based in the classics. Now, as I began my uh, research with this group uh, in southern China in 2010, there were a few facts of which I felt uh, fairly certain. First, the group was dedicated to promoting a purified vision of Chinese tradition devoid of any uh, so-called foreign influences. And uh, this is a joke I often made. And uh, now, as the years pass by, the joke gets increasingly aged. But uh, I was leaving the United States uh, during the rise of the Tea Party to conduct research in China with a group that uh, I sometimes called the Green Tea Party. Um, but uh, obviously, we've long moved beyond uh, Tea Party concerns to a, a, a brave new world of other uh, political uh, anxieties. Second, uh, members of the group were not shy about using quite inflammatory rhetoric uh, about those whom they called barbarians, meaning either uh, minorities uh, in China, um, whom they considered to be not actually Chinese, or uh, foreigners like myself. Um, we could say that uh, there have been historically, uh, one might say, two models of uh, ethnicity and uh, nationalism in China. Um, the first, uh, which really circulated around the 1911 revolution, envisioned sort of a homogenous, uh, sort of Han-dominated nation. Um, after 1949, there's been considerable, considerably more e emphasis on a uh, sort of diverse uh, nation that uh, still very much circulates around a Han-centered ideology, but then has sort of a hierarchy of nationalities envisioned on various uh, stages of development. Um, now, uh, Han clothing movement enthusiasts uh, are very much uh, enthusiasts of the, uh, the former model, uh, the vision of a homogenous uh, Han-centered nation. And third, uh, these preceding two facts uh, indicated a, a final fact, namely that the Han clothing movement was a fairly uh, extreme nationalist group uh, dedicated to a particular, a very particular vision of China. However, um, things turned out to be a, a bit more complex uh, when I began interacting closely with uh, movement enthusiasts. Uh, this is an uh, image of uh, one style of uh, Han clothing promoted by the movement. Um, attending a gathering 
uh, in the metropolis of Shenzhen uh, early in my research with this group, I expected to hear fairly straightforward nationalist narratives uh, consisting of excessive praise for one's nation and people, alongside equally passionate uh, criticisms or denunciations of other nations and people. And uh, I did indeed hear plenty of uh, denunciations of other nations and people. But considering uh, that members of the hand clothing movement are nationalists uh, dedicated to celebrating a particular idea of China, I actually came to be quite surprised by just how much time they spent actually complaining about life in China today. So uh, a young man from rural Anhui uh, asked me that afternoon, how much do you know about uh, traditional Chinese culture? Answering his own question uh, before I could, this was something I often found uh, people would pose questions to me and then kind of answer them before I had time to respond. He, he highlighted four core aspects of tradition. Um, he began from clothing. Uh, clothing, he said, was elaborate and beautiful in the pre-modern era. And proper attire was a central component ordering society, presenting a kind of a metaphorical relationship between individual bodies and the social body. He claimed that only when clothing was in order could society be in order. But people nowadays, he said, uh, wear quote unquote Western clothes. Men wear suits, he claimed, that never quite uh, fit them correctly, he said. And women walk around immodestly exposed, bringing shame upon the nation. Another central component of culture, he continued, was food. Uh, Chinese cuisine is, of course, rich and diverse. And the experience of sharing a meal creates lasting bonds between people. But he quickly added that uh, food nowadays uh, you know, is not always safe. And one has to be careful of what one eats. There is uh, the infamous gutter oil, meaning uh, discarded restaurant oil, removed from disposal sites, reprocessed, and resold, as well as genetically modified foods, which are caught up in all types of uh, conspiracy theories in the movement and in broader culture, and otherwise uh, contaminated and anxiety-inducing foods. Returning to the past, he affirmed the architectural skills of his Han ancestors. Uh, Ancient houses, he told me, were built using interlocking logs, providing unparalleled structural stability. One could remain safe from earthquakes and any other external threats, a protection no longer provided by buildings built today. Uh, pointing to the skyscrapers beyond the window, he asked, uh, how long will those buildings last? Uh, apartments fall apart nowadays before you even finish paying them off. Already seeing the pattern of this monologue, which does certain, certainly have a uh, repetitive uh, sort of pattern to it, I was not surprised when he followed up his final comments about the importance of quiet solitude and wandering within traditional Chinese culture with a simultaneously frustrated yet longing question. Where can anyone find time or space for that today? Then, uh, with a sigh, he told me, the China out there today, the China that you're visiting, that's absolutely not the real China. So all of a sudden, I was left trying to make sense of a member of a uh, nationalist group informing me that his nation uh, was, at the moment, not real. So uh, to put it lightly, I had uh, you know prepared all types of uh, ideas and theories before my field work, but uh, I wasn't exactly prepared to hear that uh, the actually existing China was not the real China. But this seemingly paradoxical comment in my analysis, in fact, reveals the uh, paradoxical core of the nationalist identificatory experience. Looking at this monologue more closely, we can see two completely different worlds emerging as uh, inverted images of one another. The undeniable and uncontainable grandeur of the past with its dignified clothing, healthy food, secure abodes, and peaceful quiet. 
Standing in stark contrast to the exposed bodies, contaminated foods, collapsing buildings, and chaotic and overwhelming cityscapes of the present. Now, although these two worlds are presented as a, a distinction between the past and the present in hand clothing narratives, I'd argue that this is really a distinction, in fact, between imagination and experience, which I would further argue are the two essential and indeed perpetually conflicting sides of any form of identity. Imagination here uh, refers to the way that my acquaintance envisioned China was and should be, while experience denotes what he actually faced in his daily life in the present uh, in the geographical and cultural space known as China. The two interact in something of a, uh, one might say, uh, instituted fantasy, uh, referring back to some of the talks we uh, heard last week from uh, Steve Sangren perpetually reproduced in its own possibility in kind of the inability of the two sides to meet one another. Now, on the topic of imagining, uh, one of the most uh, certainly influential theories of nationalism over the past few decades has, of course, been the idea of imagined communities. Uh, first developed in the uh, early 1980s, in Benedict Anderson's book uh, of the same title, this theory posits that nations are modern phenomena derived from the emergence of a print capitalism, meaning the development of the modern newspaper and novel, with their common vernacular language and simultaneous experience of what Anderson calls homogeneous empty time. And yet the prominence of imagining in Anderson's title doesn't really correspond to the role of imagining in his analysis. Um, Jonathan Ray has uh, memorably critiqued the, the glaring absence of imagining in Anderson's uh, printing press framework by pointing out that uh, it is surely, quote, uh, surely only the very coolest of nationalists who will pride themselves on belonging to a nation of newspaper readers. In order to begin to actually understand the passions and the excitement of nationalism and national identity, Ray thus proposes redirecting the discussion of imagined communities characterized by daily rituals and empty time to the analysis of the national imaginary characterized by what he calls, quote, uh, wild longings and weird fantasies and to uh, begin to consider such a national imaginary, a, a good place to start could be the monologue that I, I just uh, described to you, which contains what can only be described as a sort of fantasy construction or configuration of China, a land of grandeur, security, and quiet in which one can finally truly uh, be at peace with oneself. <coughs> Now, of course, although this fantasy construction is uh, located in the past, it is and can only be a retroactive romanticization bef benefiting uh, greatly from distance. Any and all societies are plagued with problems and uncertainties, along with, of course, the corresponding vision of a society without those problems and uncertainties. If we consider, for example, uh, the Confucian Analects, uh, the Analects indeed played an essential role in sociopolitical organization throughout the imperial era, which uh, movement enthusiasts romanticize. But were also based in the imagining and celebration of a long gone idealized uh, early Zhou era, a sort of political garden of Eden where all the rites were done correctly and everything thus worked beautifully. So even if my uh, acquaintance uh, that day in Shenzhen was somehow able to travel back in time to the pre-modern era that he idealized, he'd undoubtedly uh, probably still find plenty to complain about, and then perhaps yearn to return further back to the splendor of the early Zhou, toward which uh, people in the pre-modern era were already yearning, and which uh, at the end of the day 
you know, considering it was about 3,000 years ago, life probably wasn't all that convenient or relaxing. Okay? So this uh, perpetual disillusionment highlights the other side of the nationalist equation or the identificatory equation. For if nations are a series of longings and fantasies, as noted above, there are also actual geographic spaces in which people live in reality on a disillusioning day-by-day -day basis. So uh, while nations are imagined, uh, they're also experienced. While they're thought, they're also lived. And on account of the sort of boundless idealism of the imaginings and the inherently limiting reality of experience, these two sides never correspond. There's a, a fundamental gap between the ideas and fantasies of a community and its everyday realities. And as a result, the relationship of an imagined community to itself and its reality is a relationship founded in uh, sort of paradox and anxiety and reproduced over time precisely in its attempt to sort through these founding tensions. Now, uh, the hand clothing movement narrative of history posits a time in the past in which these contradictions weren't present, right? So how did these contradictions come to be? According to movement enthusiasts, uh, these tensions in the present are based in the purported downfall of the Han majority as the supposed core of uh, Chinese culture. Modern China is an officially multinational or uh, multi-ethnic country, with the Han constructed as the majority, constituting roughly 92% uh, of the country's population along with the uh, 55 officially recognized minorities of uh, varying size and uh, varying uh, cultural backgrounds, uh, constituting the remaining 8%. Now, in the relationship between majority and minority, the official representation of the Han seems undeniably positive, as the presumed uh, leading ethnicity within the nation the Han is symbolically tasked with the mission of modernization and development in relation to minorities who are portrayed as exotic, colorful, and simple, with amusing customs and cultures, presumed to be sexually promiscuous and prone to dancing in circles. Yet in Han clothing movement narratives, uh, the modernizing vanguard Han ethnicity constructed in contrast to the ethnic other, is uh, just like China is not the real China, this constructed Han is envisioned as not the real Han. Their uh, real Han stands on its own with ethnic characteristics that are bigger and better uh, than the quote-unquote minorities. That same afternoon uh, in Shenzhen, uh, my friend uh, equipped with a laptop Show me the image you see here. A neat summary of official representations of ethnic relations in China. This image uh, features representatives of all 56 officially recognized nationalities, each differentiated by its unique uh, so-called traditional ethnic clothing. And uh, for people who you know, may have problems remembering how many nationalities there are in China, they're conveniently, very conveniently, standing in the shape of the number 56. Uh, there is, however, one telling uh, exception to this pattern. If we uh, zoom in a bit, <laughs> you can see uh, that the representative of the Han uh, in this image is dressed in a t-shirt, shorts, and uh, sneakers, uh, which you, uh, it's not showing up as clearly uh, as it could. Um, but uh, the image is also in my book. Uh, feel free to pick up a copy. <laughs> now, uh, although this image thus embodies the positive portrayal right, of a modern Hanness, it also reminds us of a fact often overlooked in the study of ethnic relations and representation which is that being the quote-unquote unmarked default majority, 
while it can be a source of power, it can also be painfully boring, right? Insofar as one lacks any distinctive ethnic markers or characteristics to show and display to others. As the uh, presumed core of the Chinese nation, of course, uh, some members of the Han have uh, come to expect a more compelling vision than the sort of default uh, modernity embodied in t-shirts and sneakers. So the crowd sitting around me uh, that afternoon as we viewed this image shook their heads and uh, echoing the idea that today's China is not the real China, told me, uh, quote, this is not the real Han. Uh, other nationalities all have their ethnic clothing, but what about us? So the Han clothing movement is built around these dilemmas of the uh, imagined and the real China and the imagined and the real Han and the sort of endless search for their resolution. According to movement uh, participants, contemporary reality provides only a distorted imposter Han uh, existing within a similarly distorted imposter China. The Han, according to these uh, narratives, should not be wearing the clothing styles of those who movement participants uh, at times call the quote unquote Western barbarians, just as they shouldn't be living in uh, congested metropolises or spending their lives in office cubicles or on factory floors, breathing in uh, anxiety inducing air and eating anxiety inducing food. Enthusiasts uh, believe that these are all alien impositions smothering the real China below the surface. In contrast, they imagine that they should be adorned in long flowing robes, living amidst the serene quiet of rolling grassy hills, raising animals and vegetables on organic farms, and attending to such sacred matters as ritual and study of the classics. There was a kind of a curious mix and match of components in the movement imagination that makes it really difficult to label, uh, producing something almost resembling kind of very conservative, uh, xenophobic sort of back to nature hippies. It was a real kind of mix of ideologies. But this, this slightly incoherent image, they claim, uh, would be the quote unquote real Han who could then revitalize the real China. So this emphasis upon explaining and overcoming the gap in national experience reminds us that the, the failure of ideal images only results uh, in the end in a deeper and stronger reinvestment in these ideal images as a supplement to a disappointing reality. The imaginings and abstract notions circulating around the idea of a nation are greater than anything we experience in our daily lives. Yet also purportedly include us as constituents through the ideal of identity. This is the source of uh, nationalism and national identity's appeal by seemingly uh, intimately connecting us to cultural and mythical and historical elements that are far greater than ourselves. Yet even after lived experience fails to match with these ideals, one continues to be attracted to them as a supplement to the disappointment of experience. The result, I argue, is a kind of self-reproducing identity system in which people's hopes are continually raised by national imaginings. These imaginings fail to correspond to people's uh, reality. Yet these failures are then supplemented precisely by the types of imaginings that created the disappointment of the failures in the first place, leading to ever deeper reinvestment and ever deeper yearning. This can be seen most clearly in hand clothing enthusiasts' unwavering longing. The discrepancies between the ideal of China and the experience of China produce only an ever deeper desire for the missing fantasy ideal of China represented in their vision as the real China. So who then are the people who join this nationalist movement and uh, why do they join? Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce a uh, sort of profile, three members of the movement and their daily lives. 
and I'll then proceed to provide a, a brief description of their recreation through this movement toward their vision of uh, the real China, the real Han, and correspondingly, their real selves. So Liang is a single male uh, in his late 20s who lives on the edge of Shenzhen. He works as a brigade security, a job that requires that he patrol his relatively quiet village to make sure that nothing illegal is happening. The real problem in his uh, village, however, is that nothing either legal or illegal ever seems to actually happen. Uh, this is not just my opinion. Uh, he described his job as pointless, uh, boring, and poorly compensated. While those around him acquired uh, various new symbols of success, homes, cars, kids, Liang remained single, uh, living at home with his parents, and working in a countryside job, which he himself described as uh, completely meaningless. As he told me humorously uh, during our often lengthy discussions, I don't really have much uh, besides time. I had a chance to accompany him uh, over three days at work uh, in early spring 2011. Beginning the day early in sort of the main uh, square in his village, I sat on a bench while three other members of uh, brigade security on call, uh, one of whom was his supervisor, spent the morning playing cards, smoking, and uh, drifting in and out of naps. When 10 o'clock arrived, uh, Liang informed me that it was time to make the rounds. So I followed him through a few alleyways toward the southern edge of the village. When suddenly he stopped at a stand to pick up a, a bottle of a 110 proof uh, Baijiu liquor. Uh, this is a drink that's uh, very difficult to consume at 10 in the evening, so I had never really considered consuming it at 10 in the morning. Um, but Liang uh, either failed to notice my surprise or very much disregarded it. Uh, we proceeded to the kind of uh, a little uh, alleyway off to the side uh, where Liang handed me a, a flimsy plastic cup uh, and proceeded to fill it with the uh, very intense smelling concoction that was about to give us both a very numbing start to an otherwise not very memorable day. Liang told me that this spot provided a daily break from his otherwise inescapable boredom at work. He come here not only to drink, but also to read and to chat and uh, text message with friends. As we wandered back down to the main square, Liang's supervisor was in the midst of a very animated card game and either completely failed to notice our intoxication or uh, simply didn't care. The rest of the day passed uh, very uneventfully and undoubtedly many other days followed in a similar manner. In a world without any clear meaning or direction, uh, where sort of one day kind of bled into another, Liang sought meaning and fulfillment elsewhere uh, and found it in the Han clothing movement. Yen, uh, by contrast, was the uh, first Han clothing enthusiast with whom I had the opportunity to talk in depth. Uh, she was kind enough to offer to meet at a cafe near uh, Sun Yat-sen University early in my research. Arriving a, an hour and a half uh, behind schedule, in full hand clothing, her <laughs> elaborate outfit uh, contrasted almost immediately with her other, otherwise very haphazard personal style. Unlike uh, Liang, uh, Yen couldn't exactly be described as single, although she also couldn't exactly be described as committed. Over the year of my research, she had uh, romances and breakups with a series of potential suitors and was never shy about discussing her love life at uh, quite random moments. Uh, one, one minute we'd be discussing uh, sort of the history of hand clothing or the history of some type of ritual and the next minute, she would be telling me about how she was head over heels in love with an economically successful guy who was also in love with her. 
<laughs> but for some reason, they also yelled and fought all the time. And then at the next meeting, she'd tell me how unreliable and incompetent her last boyfriend had been, but how thoughtful and caring a new suitor was. Uh, I never really knew what to make of these stories, but I guess I was reassured by the fact that she also didn't know what to make of them either. Uh, remaining single into one's late 20s in China creates, uh, you know, comments and pressures from family and friends for men, likely on. But in the case of women, uh, this perceived condition, right, all too often produces this impending sense of emergency, right? There's this kind of uh, cult of female youth and virginity that uh, renders unmarried 30-year-old uh, females or increasingly 25-year-old uh, uh, women, right, uh, as shengnu or as a sort of leftover women, right? A term which is not very sensitive, uh, I would say, but nevertheless, uh, unfortunately, quite, com quite uh, commonly used. Accordingly, Yen's relationship to her single status was uh, considerably less detached and less laid back than Liang's. Her business life was similarly chaotic as she sought one get-rich-quick scheme after another, none of which ever seemed to uh, succeed in the uh, few years that I knew her. So in a world without stability, consistency, and order, as she moved from one initially promising yet ultimately uncertain situation to another, Yen uh, naturally earned for an elusive order and certainty and found it uh, in the Han clothing movement. Let's see if I have time for, uh, yeah. I first met uh, Xia uh, through a friend. Um, while we got along well, uh, she repeatedly told me throughout our conversations that she was of low culture, right? Wen uh, Di, right? A term meaning that she hadn't received a lot of formal education. Now, upon uh, learning more about her life story, I could understand her uh, certain self-consciousness, right? Where she grew up, she said people's understanding of gender was, uh, quote unquote, very backward and preferences leaned heavily towards sons over daughters. Uh, according to her, in her home village, a family was expected by a quote-unquote tradition to have at least a son, uh, or preferably two sons, you know, in order to avoid becoming sort of a laughing stock of the village. Xiao's family had three daughters in a row, one after another, before they finally had their first son. Yet this happy resolution to her parents' uh, quote-unquote problem uh, eventually, be, uh, actually very quickly, became a source of uh, consistent real-life problems for her. Once her baby brother was born, her parents decided they needed to save up for his education. He would be going to university, right? Um, so Xia was told to drop out of school and go to the city to make some money. The pressures that her parents had previously faced in their efforts to produce a son to secure their future were immediately transferred to her, and she now had no choice but to sacrifice her own future in order to guarantee her younger brothers. Beginning with a series of tiring and uh, low-paying jobs in the makeshift factories of Guangzhou's urban migrant communities, Xia desperately sought a reliable source of income for her parents to pass on to her younger brother. Moving to the edge of the city to find cheap housing, she told me that she had noticed one day that a local karaoke hall was hiring. Um, the job included free room and board, prov providing her with more money to send back home, which of course made her family happy. And uh, while I never, broached the subject of what exactly her work involved. Karaoke halls, uh, you know, for people who aren't familiar, can be uh, a bit sketchy. I can say that whatever it was that she did, uh, you know, she wasn't uh, very happy with her work life. She told me that she was just really tired out and not happy with where life had taken her. On an average night, she told me she'd work until two or three in the morning go to her dormitory, take a shower, 
and hopefully get to sleep by 3 or 4 a.m. Living on site, having no vacation time, the majority of her young adult life was completely beyond her control. Confined to a smoky and likely quite seedy karaoke hall in order to save up for her younger brother. So in a world in which she exercised no real control over her own daily life, Xia naturally desired a certain dignity and control that was otherwise perpetually lacking. And she found this uh, in the Han clothing movement. Now, uh, I'd now like to show a brief clip of a sort of uh, theme song of the movement entitled uh, Returning to the Era of Han and Tang, which refers to two dynasties in Chinese history that are perceived as uniquely glorious. Right? And in contrast to the all too real stories of people's daily lives that I just uh, described above, this video is a useful representation of the movement's uh, self-portrayal of Hanness and Chineseness. <laughs> Still too loud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, uh, YouTube only has the uh, karaoke version of this uh, video, so the characters will be at the bottom, but there's no uh, vocals. So. I'll give you a sense, right, uh, of the song. Um, now, uh, the three individuals whose uh, daily lives I just described took on vastly different personas, right, within the Han clothing movement. Personas removed from their uh, daily stresses and affirmed through awe-inspiring images of five millennia of grandeur as seen here. Because the uh, internet provides an ideal space for imagining such alternate realities, this most modern of communication tools has ironically provided the foundation for this growing traditionalist movement. In online interactions, for example, uh, Xia took on the pseudonym Legend of the Phoenix, uh, Feng Huang Chuan Shuo, right? while uh, Liang took on the name Six-Veined Sacred Sword. As, uh, as you can probably tell, uh, these are not in any way, shape, or form actually traditional Chinese names. There wasn't anybody uh, walking around in the Ming Dynasty uh, with the name Six-Veined Sacred Sword. 
But these names do express a certain fantastic and mystical imagining of personhood in pre-modern China, um, which was also sort of reflected in that video, right? Toward which participants earn, and which is really, at the end of the day, what I believe this movement uh, is all about. Um, people often ask me, you know, uh, well, is Han clothing, uh, you know, kind of an accurate representation of uh, what uh, clothing was really like in the past? And that's an interesting question, but I, I think to a degree, it kind of misses the main point of this movement, wherein, uh, to a degree, kind of fantasy, I think, trumps any type of authenticity or careful research on the past, really uh, on all fronts. Now, despite the efficiency of the internet for generating space for alternate realities, thereby explaining the initial rise of this movement online in 2001 and 2002, there's still a desire to move beyond the internet and to bring these imaginings into the external reality uh, that they respond to and deny. It was thus not long after the first sketches of hand clothing appeared online a decade and a half ago that a few pioneers began preparing actual clothing, uh, wearing them in public spaces, and eventually hosting uh, regular weekend gatherings um, now held in cities across China, which uh, produce temporary spheres, recreating the movement's uh, real China one morning at a time. Symbolically, in an era in which practicality and calculation are uh, essential strategies in human relations, hand clothing with its long robes and multiple layers is uh, anything but practical, uh, particularly in the subtropical climate of uh, southern China. A similarly ambivalent relationship to the present uh, can be seen in the design and movement activities. Participants seek sites with a pleasing natural background, removed from the usual hectic and exhausting urban environment. Okay, this is uh, a picture of a gathering uh, in central Guangzhou uh, where movement participants were trying to pose for a photograph with this uh, very nice fountain, but got photobombed uh, by these two uh, <laughs> individuals who jumped in and uh, immediately did this. Um, so uh, many uh, movement activities happen in parks, mountains, or tea houses to kind of get away from kind of the chaos of everyday urban life. As participants enter this secluded, alternative space, they greet one another by extending their hands and bowing slowly and solemnly, marking this space off as a sacred sphere of purified identity production. From that moment onward, participants use their pseudonyms to recast their self-image, while various forms of etiquette and ritual oversee interactions, recreating the social bonds between people. In the winter of 2011, I attended one such movement activity, a traditional ceremony in Guangzhou, marking a young woman's passage into adulthood. Adjacent to a noisy intersection with eight lanes of traffic and a, a dusty construction site, the apartment hosting the ceremony was uncharacteristically serenely quiet. Um, this picture is from a, uh, oh, this picture is from a similar ceremony uh, later in my research. As we entered, we exchanged uh, customary traditional greetings and gathered in silence in preparation for the ceremony to begin. The master of ceremonies had a tendency to speak in a arcane classical Chinese that no one fully understood. But not understanding really added uh, to the sort of mystical aura of the event. We watched in silence as a young woman in hand clothing knelt upon a pillow and had a series of hairpins inserted into her hair, one at a time, enacting a smooth, quick, and completely conflict-free passage into adulthood. All right? It's important to note that this conflict-free transition to adulthood is quite distinct from the actual existing transitions to adulthood that I described in the profiles above. This, uh, my companions reassured me, 
was, quote unquote, the real China, right? In a world that can often be noisy and confusing, the ritual space was quiet and peaceful. In a world that can often seem meaningless or purposeless, every figure and every action within the ritual space, no matter how tiny, no matter how uh, seemingly meaningless, all the way down to the insertion of a hairpin, was presumed to actually have deep symbolic meaning. The precise meaning uh, was never actually as important as its simple presence as meaning. Yet even more importantly, in a world that's perpetually unpredictable and uncontrollable, the ritual was a thoroughly ordered process. There were clearly demarcated steps, each with their symbolic meanings, tested and passed down from one generation to the next, proceeding naturally one to the next, and eventually emerging, right, as a full-fledged adult. Rituals tend to evolve around uh, significant passages in life, whether becoming an adult, getting married. And such rituals have in turn emerged as a particular focus of the movement. Uh, these are, after all, precisely the issues that have vexed many movement participants in the tension between expectations and reality. Responding to these tensions, participants imagined the real China in the ritual space as kind of a, an inversion of real life, a charmed and serene realm free from the concerns and constraints of everyday experience, endowed throughout with meaning and perfectly ordered and controllable. Then all of a sudden, just as this, this ritual was uh, drawing to a close, a kind of jackhammer-like clamor reverberated through the room, freezing us all in response. Uh, when it finally stopped, our host explained that a, a new elevator was being installed in his apartment building and that the drilling was quite noisy, a, a fact of which we were all already very much aware. And again, reality had ever so rudely interrupted this attempt at constructing what movement participants viewed as the quote unquote real China. The rest of the activity that day never quite returned to the calm that preceded this interruption. And while the sudden noise obviously disturbed us, it also served to reaffirm that yearning for a reality free from such disruptions. The real China, which uh, members of the hand clothing movement sought, was, at the end of the day, imaginary. A giant screen onto which participants projected their hopes and desires in search of perpetually impossible realization trapping themselves in a self-reproducing identity cycle whose solution is always sought in its founding dilemma. So uh, although much contemporary scholarship focuses on finding and criticizing quote unquote uh, orientalist uh, imaginings and mystifications of the other, I think some of these uh, events highlight how people are often engaged in uh, similarly imagining, mystifying, and power-laden rela power relationships with their own national communities, which are at once the self uh, and an always elusive imagined other. And it's precisely this perpetual otherness of what is supposed to be one's self, an ideal self, that drives the passions and desires characteristic of nationalism and identity formation in general. It's because the notions of Han and China are ideas in which participants seek to fulfill and complete themselves that they elevate these ideas to points that are never able to be fully attained in reality. Yet this unattainability is denied in the construction and reconstruction of history and identity ensuring this concept's perpetuation. So while the ideals of authentic Hanness and Chineseness are presented by Han clothing movement participants as solutions, right, to the many pressing socio-political problems of the present in China today, I'd argue that these ideas are in fact just another such problem, sort of irresolvable paradoxes which participants unwaveringly attempt to work through, but can never fully disentangle. All of the while, 
uh, illusorily naturalized under the seemingly common sense and natural, yet actually perpetually elusive ideal of uh, national identity. So uh, that's the end of my talk, and uh, thanks for listening.